I'm Riley Reese. This is the Sophia Unfiltered podcast where we bring together thought leaders, wellness entrepreneurs, makers, and emerging health leaders. We're here to have raw, unfiltered conversations because sharing your stories has the power to change lives, help others heal, and transform the way we take care of ourselves. Here we go. This episode contains discussion of suicide. If you or someone you know are experiencing suicidal thoughts, you can connect with a 24-hour suicide and crisis lifeline by dialing or texting 988. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Riley Michelle here on Sophia Unfiltered, and today we are delighted to talk to Dr. Carter Check. He is a board-certified behavioral health chaplain, currently working with the Integrative Mental Health Team and the Moral Injury Network, providing care for veterans nationwide. He leads the Real Moral Injury Clinics and is a member of the Suicide Prevention and Postvention Teams. He was a 19 Delta Cavalry Scout in the U.S. Army, attached to the 2nd Infantry Division, stationed in South Korea, and the 3rd Infantry Division stationed in Fort Stewart, Georgia. Dr. Chuck is a moral injury survivor himself. He's walked the path and emerged even stronger, has co-created a nationally used workbook to help support our veterans recovering from morally injurious events. His dedication and expertise have not gone unnoticed. He's presented at national conferences, facilitated podcasts, and led national webinars. He's also a published author with two notable publications showcasing his work, as well as the founder of Hunt Therapy. So without further ado, let's welcome the remarkable Dr. Carter Check. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm always looking around to see who you're talking about whenever people introduce you. You know, like, hey, where is that guy at? So <laughs> really appreciate that. Very kind. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Um, I mean, there's so much to talk about here. So, I mean, from Army to Chaplin, um, by way of Vanderbilt, just a lot to talk about here. And so, um, and working with veterans, I think this is an incredible journey. Uh, do you want to take us back to, I guess, your your time and in, in as a scout? Yeah. So, scout means something a little, a little different to me. My oldest son is an active duty Cav Scout. Um, my oldest nephew is also a Cav Scout, and I can look back to I think my my fifth generation grandfather was a was a Scout in the Seventh Kentucky Cavalry. So, um, what does that mean? Just Growing up in the outdoors, understanding um, the importance of respecting the woods, hunting and harvesting only what you want to eat. Man, to be a scout is to, in many ways, to be an early warning system. You're really, uh, your job function is what we were always called as the eyes and ears of the army. You know, we would go out ahead, try and find the enemy, try and find positions, try and find size, strength, um, uh, things that would give us an advantage as far as intel goals. We were never really set up to take anything out. We were more designed to sneak and peek and, and move around, hence uh, recon, scout. But I think the the time in my season as a scout I want to tell you about is not all the cool stuff I did, not the awards, not the excellence in Calvary, being promoted out of basic training, just being a really squared away soldier. It was when I got to South Korea, my my company was in the field. So, and remember, I've served uh, 95 through 97. So I served in peacetime in between the first Iraq war and the um, altercation in Bosnia. So grew up in South Georgia, good shot with a rifle, uh, which bode me very well once I got into basic training and all those types of things, because if you're a good shot. It draws attention. You know, I started out shooting some of my base drill sergeants and everybody else. And then that led to, okay, Carter's sharpshooter type material, which was good. But when I got to South Korea in the field, what we were is we were oppositional forces. So through all the training, my company and specifically my scout platoon, we were designed to just sneak around and attack, attack all of our friends in training, which it was a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong. I did that for nine months out of the 12 months I was there. But after I was in the field with my unit for about a month, we came back to post. My platoon sergeant was PCSing back to the United States. So anytime your platoon sergeant or your platoon leader were leaving, that was a big deal. You know, it's a big deal. They've been there for a year. 
uh, you know, sort of a changing of the guard and, and a party and, and stuff. And so I was off post with one of my, well, my battle buddy, OB. And as we were walking back towards the base, uh, a car almost ramps over on the street where it was really cars were limited. They weren't supposed to be driving on these streets because of the amount of people that were out in the town on these specific nights. And, uh, yeah, car comes zipping by almost, I mean, almost really nailed us. Um, and so much so, you know, I'd been there a month, didn't know the language, didn't know what was being said, but I knew what, whatever was being said between Olin and them wasn't really good because just tone and body language, not. And remember I'm 18 years old. I'm on the other side of the world. So I kind of pushed Olin into this little place and the car took off and it's about 2.35 ish. And we got to be on post at three. Yeah. Be right back on post. Cause you're not on post by three. You're sleeping off post and um, nobody wants that. Um, and nobody wants the trouble that comes from that too. So we start walking our, uh, walking back towards the post and um, that car is pulled off to the side of the road. That carload of guys, there were seven of them were standing outside. And as we walked by, they recognized my battle buddy and here we go. And as I'm standing there just in support, I start seeing us get surrounded. And um, Owen's just in an argument. He's not really paying attention. Now I'm super hyper vigilant. And one of the guys starts going into his pocket. And that was it. Um, we ended up putting three of those guys in the hospital. Uh, Korean police ended up snagging Olin. We we're just, you know, defending ourselves. Ended up, I mean, it was, it was a situation where I actually had two guys. I was dragging them across the street to the front gate and yelling for the MPs. And then they came out and got the guys off of me, but the Korean police, the local police actually got Olin and took him with them. So here I am sitting at the front gate waiting for my company commander and LT. And this is a big deal. So they pick us up. We go down to the Korean police station. They had really worked over, over, uh, they worked Olin over pretty good. They beat him up. Uh, the cops did beat him up. And one of the kids, and I'm going to say kid, cause I was a kid, I was 18. They were probably my age, not much older, um, was the son of a Korean diplomat. And the army offered me and Olin up to the Korean government to prosecute us for assault and battery. And this wasn't something that never happened before. I think this had happened often, you know, American soldiers getting in fights off base with nationals, but it just so happened this time, wrong place, wrong time, wrong person. So. That night, I remember going to sleep, waking up the next day, and my wrist was like, oh, my gosh, what is going on? Well, I broke my wrist in the altercation, but didn't realize it until the next morning. So I went to the hospital, got casted up that afternoon, went and met with our you know, command, and they kind of let us in on what's going to happen. Now, from battalion down, felt super supported. You know, we got you. You know, you're defending yourself. You did the right thing, blah, blah, blah. But from division... It was so very political. Looking back, I'm 47 now. Looking back to then, I was like, I didn't realize what really was happening to me in that period of time as I'm wearing an American uniform, serving my country, living in another country, protecting their country. And now once a month, I have to get in my dress greens and I got to go down to court because assault and battery in South Korea is a life sentence. And I've got three I'm looking at. Felt really betrayed. Um, the nine months is up. The jury finds us guilty. The judge then, and there's like, you know, the people who were against us and testifying and, you know, come to find out, I didn't understand half of it, but there wasn't a lot of truth being told, you know, about how that happened. But, you know, how he says, I don't even know what they're saying to begin with. And our attorney speaks like broken English. So, um, I remember them being happy and I remember looking at all and like, man, we're going to jail. That's what, that was my thought. And then I remember the judge starts speaking and all those people who are really happy are now it's, it's, you know, it's like your, your football team just lost in the last seconds of a field goal. You're like, Oh my gosh, it was like such a turn of events. 
And I'm looking at my attorney like, what's going on? And he's got this look on his face like almost like it's something he hasn't experienced before. That's what I would say about it. And so come to find out the the judge starts speaking in English. And he looks at me and Olin and he berates us for conduct and unbecoming and, you know, we should be set examples. And then he thanks us for serving, for being there, protecting his family, you know, their democracy, all of that. And then he bans us from ever coming back to South Korea after we leave serving there. And he reverses our prison sentence, like right there. So I was like, wow, like, wow is all I could say. You you go back to doing your job. Now, remember I said I broke my wrist. So for me and for anybody in the military, if you have an injury, it's called a profile. So you have a profile. And when you have a profile, uh, that keeps you from being able to complete military standard physical fitness test. Right. I know you know what I'm talking about here. Right. And so I had a broken wrist. I broke my scaphoid, actually, and I couldn't do a military push up. Now, remember, I was squared away. I was usually the LT's gunner or driver. I was always one of the. Uh, I was a good soldier, good shot. You wanted me on your squad. You 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 needed me on your team, to be quite honest. Um, because I was going to follow instructions or I could take the lead uh, and do what we needed to do. Um, and there it wasn't a big deal, but when I PCS back stateside, nobody knew my story. I really wouldn't tell that story much. (laughs) I was kind of, uh, carried some shame attached to it, you know? And then specifically, you know, when you start talking to people who had been in the first Iraq war and some of the things they went through compared to what I went through, I was like, why am I going to tell this story? I mean, this guy had to pivot steer on a bunker and bury 200 Iraqi soldiers. I didn't have to do that. I defended myself. I had a platoon sergeant when I came back who was super old school, didn't care about my story, didn't care. All he cared was that he had a soldier on his report that couldn't complete a physical fitness test. So I'd love to sit here and say my moral injury really started when the army offered me up to be prosecuted. And that would be truthful. That's part of it. But I wasn't someone who was ever considered less than in my lifetime. I wasn't hazed. I wasn't, you know, every time there was guard duty, holiday duty, burn barrel duty, any type of duty you could think of, private check got it. I got the duty. So when people are like, hey, why'd you only do your two years plus training and then you got out? Well, let me tell you why. I didn't want to stay in the military because of my experience. Now, fast forward, right, from the scout days. And I wish I could have sat there and told you about all the really cool stuff. But I think that's the most significant part of this conversation, right? So fast forward um, later in life, I'm going to say around the 2008-ish era, I really started to, I I think my tank started running on empty, um, not understanding, first of all, the PTSD I was dealing with, but also this moral injury I was dealing with where I really felt betrayed. I felt betrayed by the people who should be protecting me. And that, that goes deep back even to my childhood and some adverse childhood experiences that I've had myself where I felt like I should have been protected. Right. I felt like, you know, so those same things, helplessness, hopelessness, um, uh, started sticking their heads up. And so when I went to the VA to really try and find some peace, nothing really existed, nothing for this. Right. And, um, so really I developed it. Um, I developed what I felt like I needed to take ownership. You know, I always tried to beat away my trauma. Like I had a big bat and I was just going to, oh, you're going to come over here. Oh, come on. I can hit you. I can hit you from the left or the right. And there was a day that I just made a conscious. I was intentional about making the conscious decision that instead of trying to beat all this stuff away, And let's be honest, trying to forget is exactly like remembering. It's only worse. 
because not only do you have to deal with the anxiety of remembering, you also have to deal with the compounding anxiety of that you can't forget it. So, wow, Lo, what are you going to do? Deal with it. So I decided to deal with it. I'm just going to try to beat it away. I'm just going to deal with it. It's not going anywhere. So that really started um, a really good process with me with a couple of therapists. Um, to this day, I still have to, I think I'm someone that needs to, uh, just because of my day job and what I carry and the vicariousness of some of that I need. But then I also need someone to help me make sure I'm communicating well with my wife. So that's good. It's like a tune up for your car. I think what I found was the ability to take unbearable pain and turn it into livable disappointment. Now, I know I know livable disappointment doesn't sound like much of a prize unless it's weighed against unbearable pain. And I think that a lot of those that I come into connection with that have suffered morally injurious events, that's what they're dealing with. They're dealing with unbearable pain and they don't know how to displace it. They don't know how to deal with it. Um, and I think a big part of that process is there needs to be a deconstruction in the language that they use, right? Um, if I lined up a thousand veterans outside and I said, tell me your trigger, I would bet you my paycheck, every single one of them is going to tell me something negative. Now that is a container that I believe we have built around military personnel, veterans, active. When, when we as providers talk about triggers, usually we talk about it in a negative context, but are all triggers negative? No, some triggers are very positive and getting unstuck for me sounded like a very ambitious goal. But what I had to really work on was not trying to get back to the place I was, but that meaning making system that had been fractured I needed to make it what it needed to be today for me to get to tomorrow. And that was a lot like being a scout. You had to find your way through the terrain. I believe that I started writing or drawing my personal map of recovery the day that altercation took place in South Korea, because I believe grief is as individual as your thumbprint. And you're literally drawing your map as you go. I'm still drawing that map today. But yeah, I think that tells a little bit about my trauma, my history. Um, without getting too far into the weeds um, where we can't come back. But uh, I'm a story of resiliency. And Hunt Therapy, which is my nonprofit work, really is just a conceptualization of my own self-care plan. And when I say hunt therapy, I don't mean just the killing and harvesting of animals. It's more of what you need to pursue after. What do you need to hunt after personally, you to find purpose in your life? For me, I really struggled until I found purpose. Everybody's got problems. You show me someone who's connected to purpose and I'll show you someone who has the ability to walk through and over problems almost many times like they don't even exist. And so uh, I hope I'm more of a purpose dealer, if I can say that, in this life with people I come into contact with. Yeah, I hope I help them lean into purpose in their life. I'm really curious to know more about hunt therapy and what that entails specifically. Yeah, so hunt therapy was my dissertation from Vanderbilt on using outdoor recreation therapy as upstream suicide prevention. And I would say probably the most impactful part of that research for me, um, I really dove into diagnostic criteria for trauma and non-diagnostic criteria for trauma. Because look, I'm a chaplain by degree. My arena of care is spiritual care, soul care, you know, whatever you want to call it, it's really more important what you think it is than what I think it is. Right. Um, but I would say, um, in the context of behavioral medicine, spiritual care is simply what gives an individual meaning, purpose, and values. And a lot of times when a person experiences trauma, 
that's all the first stuff to get fractured. Oh my gosh, this happened to me. What does this mean about me? What does this mean for my family? What does this say about me, right? You know, I'm working with a veteran currently who in Iraq had to plow through a crowd of kids with his Humvee. And now he's grandfather, right? This is the first Iraq war. So he's a grandfather, 10 years older than me. And he has the hardest time spending a lot of time with his grandkids. He has eight of them, eight of them, because they remind him of the kids that he ran over. Working with a detective who was first on the scene and had to hold up the woman who had died by suicide, hanging herself for 10 minutes because they were having a hard time cutting the knot. So he's bear hugging her, holding her up. Okay. Well, this woman looks exactly like his wife. So now every time his wife wants to be intimate, wants to be close, wants to give a hug, wants to, you know, sit close, all he can see is that dead woman that he was holding up. And there's so many different stories of where moral injury finds itself around trauma, PTSD, right? It just, it's just there. It's, it's almost like they're neighbors, not in every case, but in many cases. And of course, the two that I just gave you, it's, it's the inability to tell with the detective. He can't tell his wife. He can't tell his wife that every time you're close to me, all I think about is that dead woman I was holding. Right. And then there slips in the, the major parts of, you know, and I say there's faces to moral injury. One face is a perpetration model that Dr. Brett Litz really gets into. Go check it out. 2009, they put out a big thing and they really talk about moral injury as you've perpetrated or been perpetrated, right? It's a seeing something that you wished you hadn't or being involved in something that maybe you could have stopped, but maybe you didn't. And it really just gets into your will of being how involved in something, right? Perpetration. And then later, Jonathan Shea really talked about the betrayal model. And thank God for that, because I might still be lost in the, lost in the wind if Jonathan Shea hadn't really bought that. But the face of moral injury I tend to be more focused on is the face of loss, the loss connected to the morally injurious event. And with both of these gentlemen that I just explained, the th some of the things they love the most, this injury is standing in between them and intimacy, right? So in that work with hunt therapy, it's really the pursuit after what you need to be the best version of yourself, right? So whether you're hunting after rock climbing or white-tailed deer or feeding birds, you know, whatever that is, whatever you need to pursue after that gives you meaning, that gives you purpose, that adds to your values, then go do it. If that's hiking or, you know, wilderness bathing. I mean, I, I saw, I, I covered a whole lot of stuff, right, that I'll probably never do. Um but there's also just something about nature itself. Maybe it's not what you do in nature, but it's just your connectivity to nature, right? The sunset, the wind on a hot day, the wind on a cool day, right? I don't know. There's many things more therapeutic than a, a nice fire uh, to sit by, right? And just to feel. And so looking back in my life and the self-care that I had to build, not just to continue to do my day job, but just to continue to, I believe, flourish as a human. What I found out is I did a meta-analysis on 94 different research projects that connected suicidality and loneliness. I would say the main thing that I got out of it is that loneliness is a motivational phase factor. It's a propellant or an accelerant into suicidal ideations and behaviors. The reason loneliness is so dangerous is because it's introspective. You can't see it in someone where isolation you could see. You could look across the room and you could see if someone was isolated. And there are levels of isolation that are dangerous and there's levels of isolation that aren't. Just like there's levels of levels of guilt that are dangerous 
And then there's levels of guilt that are necessary, right? A level of guilt that is dangerous is something that I really see in a lot of veterans I work with when they've suffered survivor's guilt, but it's really turned from guilt to shame. So it's not just guilt, it's survivor's shame. And what I mean by that is anything they do to try and commit to forward progress, to making life better, to making themselves better, shame stands in the way and says, you're not worth it. Go blow your brains out. <laughs> you're, the people in this world would be better off without you. Your kids would be better off without you. And you already know your wife would be better off without you, right? That's that voice of shame. Shame, usually the language of it is rumination from, for the most part. When I hear rumination from someone, I, I, I recognize that there's a shame component usually. But on the reverse, if I hear determination from someone, then I really feel like that's stemming from a place of hope, hope in themselves, hope in community, hope in life, whatever that looks like. When you hear determination, it's more forward thinking, um, more about what can I do, not what's happened to me. And I think that's the role of hunt therapy in my life or in anybody's life is just to help settle you into that space where you understand mindfulness and breathing and connectedness and community are probably the most important things in your life, right? The only way in all of my research, you know, the diagnostic stuff, anxiety, depression, PTSD, military, sexual trauma, traumatic brain injury, I can go on and on. Those are all major drivers, I think, to isolation and loneliness, which are the worst risk factors. And on the non-diagnostic side, the helplessness, hopelessness, unworthiness, right? Things that you can't really, I'd say, adequately measure. It's not necessarily a pill you can take for them, although some might argue there is. Um, it's really more about how you see yourself, how you see the world, maybe even how you see God for people of a theistic faith, right? And all of those are so central to how an individual makes meaning, how they process their trauma. Um, and I believe that when you can effectively intervene in meaning, and I don't mean me as a chaplain or a provider intervening in their meaning, but when that individual can effectively intervene in their meaning, that's a great building block to where they need to go. That's a great first step. I mean, how many times have you heard the old thing, time heals all wounds? Come on. Is there a bigger lie that's ever been told? Um, time doesn't heal all wounds. Um, time gives you a space to hopefully be strengthened, to find courage, um, to live through those moments of pain, but it doesn't erase them. And so how, what does life look like? taking that unbearable pain and turning it into livable disappointment. And uh, again, I know livable disappointment doesn't sound like much of a prize unless it's weighed against unbearable pain. And so when I speak in the context of, you know, veterans or service people, and I talk about whether I'm speaking to a group of PGA professionals that are doing free lessons for veterans and active uh, around the game of golf through the PGA Hope program, or I'm speaking, you know, at the local Air Force base to their personnel about moral injury or anything. Um, I usually ask before I start, how many of you have ever experienced loss before? Wow. Would you be surprised if everybody raises their hand? No, that we, because we all have. And I always say, Loss is loss, the type of loss that military personnel sometimes experience. It's just a little different. It's a little different type of loss. Um, but if I can get them to, and I don't want to say normalize, I don't know that we can normalize loss, right? Um, but if we can get them to understand just a little bit about that space, then I think empathy goes a long way in creating community and connection, which I believe are the only ways to combat isolation and loneliness. We create moments for people to be a part of. 
Yeah, the loneliness really spoke to me with moral injury and really any type of trauma. The more we keep it to ourselves, the more it festers and we're just rattling around with our thoughts where it just takes one person to say, me too, or I can totally see why that happened or what other choice did you have? You know, even talking about your own experience with, well, is this really fair to compare to combat? I wasn't in combat, so maybe I don't have the right to talk about this. And pain is pain you know, no matter what it is, I've seen a lot of healing occur between different eras of veterans. So the Vietnam guys saying to the Iraq guys, like, oh, you guys have it so hard out there. Like, I can't even imagine the Iraq guys saying back to the Vietnam vets, you guys didn't have any training. What were you doing out there? And just having that empathy for each other, I've seen so much healing and that connection through something like hunt therapy. So it's the nature, which is healing inherently. But then that connection with other people, sitting around the fire, um, you know, engaged in activity, moving your bodies, so healing and so brilliant that you brought those elements together. Yeah, I would love to say that I'm brilliant to do it. But again, I was just following my own model of self-care. You know, when I was a young boy out riding my bike all the time and playing in the woods, I didn't know that it was part avoiding things and the other part trying to find that place of synergy for myself because I'm just eight years old. Right. And, uh, yeah, you know, what's so beautiful. And I'm just in the middle of my 46th 12 week group with the workbook we created, uh, called real. And, um, that's just amazing to think about that. Uh, in all the work that I've done in just, sitting with these veterans in their morally interest events and, 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 and grateful that I've been able to sit in some co-ed too. Cause you know, one of the things is it's not just combat zone deployed male veterans that suffer from moral injury. And let's be honest, it's not just veterans, right? Moral injury is a human thing. Um, the days that you see an individual get it, you know, there's, and this is what I mean by that. There's three questions I ask every high risk veteran that I work with. When I first initially make a phone call to assess or connect with them, there's three questions. The first one is, where do you draw your strength from? Very inclusive, very non-intrusive, right? Where do you draw your strength from? I'm just looking for resiliency, right? The second one is, what does your support system look like outside of the VA? I can look in their chart and see what it looks like inside. Are they making their mental health appointments? Are they seeing their primary care, right? Are there any functions or groups that are involved in? Again, looking for resiliency and protective factors. But this last one, I really draw from the work around motivational interviewing. And um, I use the importance ruler. And I'm just like, hey, on a scale of zero to 10, zero being I don't care at all. And 10 being, you know, it's the most important thing to me, how important is it for you to live? Sometimes I get zeros. Rarely do I get a 10. Um, Usually I'd say the average is probably five to seven. And because I'm not a fixer, right? If you take the word treat patients and you break it down in Latin, the word treat means to drag and a patient is a passive long-term sufferer. So if my goal is to treat or fix someone, right, then what I'm effectively doing is I'm dragging along a passive long-term sufferer. Now, I don't know about y'all. That doesn't sound very empowering, does it? Yeah. And look, I know that the language around a lot of the work we do is to treat patients. I get that. And I'm not trying to undermine or, or tick anybody off, okay? I'm just doing linguistics around the words. But if you take the word companion in the same sense, Word calm means with and pan is bread. So it's more like breaking bread with someone. It's more like that type of encounter. Okay. And because that's how I want to encounter these folks, I don't ask them how I can get them to attend. I ask them to help me understand why they're not a one and I shut up. And what I get is evoked from within them. Whatever resiliency, whatever protect, whatever is keeping them alive, I'm about to hear it because I'm not going to speak until I do. And I think a lot of times around trauma and, and maybe you all seen this as well. 
just the same way there's shock, you know, and people don't remember or they see it differently. I think around moral injury, there's this shock to how you see yourself, to how you see the world, right? That place where you make meaning is fractured and you almost wouldn't even know what is giving you resiliency, even if it was written out for you because you can't see it until you want to see it. And so I think that part of intervening in meaning is not cloak and dagger or fog and mirrors or anything like that. It's just helping someone see what's super important to them. What do you mean by super important? I mean, what's keeping you alive? What is that? Is it your service dog? Is it your daughter, you know, Suzanne? Is it your stepdaughter? Whatever it is, that's really where we need, you know, I'm amazed. And some people might not even know this, but I know you all will, you know, if somebody hands me a completed Columbia, I kind of know where I need to go with this conversation, right? If they're screening someone for suicide and they do a Columbia and I see it, I, I have an idea of kind of where, where we probably need to go, but I'm amazed that some people out there would get a completed Columbia and they would just decide to go with the, some agenda. Let's check some boxes over here. We'll get into all that later. The suicide data that we have, which is always tragic and always late, right? I mean, we're operating on data from what, 2020 still, right? We should get some new numbers here pretty soon, which I don't believe are going to be great. But when you talk about, you know, suicides per day per the national suicide statistics, um, we have people say they'll say 22. I'm trying to remember when was the last time the number was 22, like 2012 or 13 or something way long ago, right? And, and listen, any number above zero is unacceptable. But even over the last three years, it's gone down, down, down. And even during COVID, and it's amazing that we talk about COVID like it's BC or AD, like it spans time. Um, but COVID, I think, and now remember, I'm a suicide prevention chaplain that worked on a team all through COVID and since then. So I'm not just talking about statistics. I'm talking about real statistics from my team. 2020 just normalized loneliness and isolation for people. It normalized it. Everybody who was locked up, now the people who really suffered from it were like, oh, now everybody's lonely, right? And then when it started to open back up again, I hate to say it, but our, our, our numbers for 21 and 22 are going to be just terrible. They're not going to be where they are today. And they're always undocumented anyways, because we don't get all of the numbers of veterans that die by suicide. but and we had over 6,000 die in 2020, and it wasn't even, I don't even think it's going to be, that might just be a percentage of what we see next time. So I'm not really looking forward to that. And, and trust me, I'm not a Debbie Downer, um, uh, but I am a realist, and I know what I've experienced. I know the loss that I've experienced as a, uh, as a clinical chaplain in that space, um, which is why postvention support is so important. Postvention is prevention. So working as a part of a postvention team is also tough too, because in many clinical spaces, the people who handle prevention also handle postvention, like my station, and it really shouldn't be that way. I don't believe that as a chaplain on the team, if I suffer a loss by suicide from somebody that I care for, that now I should be handling the bereavement and the aftercare of the staff. What we do, we do, and we do it because um, we're not going to let nobody fill the space. But yeah, I guess I'm sharing a little bit of my uh, my own stuff here um, because those are some of the things you think about too. Caring for the ones that care for others, right? And I just happen to be in that. But sometimes I need care, which is why self care is uh, so important. I think it's as important as oxygen. I have a sweatshirt that says self-care is healthcare. It's like, yes. 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 Dr. Check, I was curious if we have listeners right now that might be suffering from moral injury or might be entertaining these suicidal thoughts, or maybe even a loved one that's, that's looking after somebody that's feeling this way. Could you speak directly to them and just from your heart? Yeah, absolutely. I would love to read some 
some of the veterans words that have been used after they have worked through moral injury care. Right. Cause I can sit and I can, I can talk about it all day long um, and do many times, but there are some that say I can love again and I can be loved. So there was an individual who, because of their moral injury felt like they couldn't be loved or that they could love anyone, right? They had lost that sense of connection. I do my best not to hurt people anymore. I can only imagine that that veteran felt like they had hurt a lot of people, right? And continued to hurt a lot of people, possibly taken what they would consider um, civilian lives or casualties. One said, I'm as angry as I was, but I manage it better now. Yeah, that to me is a lot of that taking unbearable pain and turning it into livable disappointment. Yeah, I'm still angry, but I sure do manage it a lot better. Maybe you're out there and you don't manage your anger well at all. There is the ability to do that. You just got to, I'm going to say take a chance or a risk or whatever that sounds like. But I guess I would say this, could it be that if you want something you've never had before, you just might have to be willing to do something you've never done before, right? We hear the definition of insanity, right? Over and over again, right? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Maybe don't try and do the same thing. Maybe take a chance, take a risk, uh, put yourself out there. One says, the people in my life tell me they see me differently. Maybe you'd like to be seen differently. Maybe you feel misunderstood. Maybe you feel that your story isn't something that you can share with those that you love around you. And maybe quite possibly you've convinced yourself that if you did share with them, it would only harm them. I'm not so sure that's true. I might go as far as saying the very thing you think is protecting them very well could be harming them by not sharing. Um, you'd be surprised uh, what can take place when you allow yourself the compassion to share what it is that you feel like is so deeply connected to shame that you don't want to share with anybody. And maybe you never do share it with your family. That's okay. I'm not sitting here saying, oh, you better share this or you'll never survive. That's not me. Don't hear that from me. But I can tell you this, first opportunity you get, if you don't want to share it with anybody, go find yourself a nice journal and write down your story, write down how you feel, write down your fears, write down the things that are keeping you from wanting to share the story with others, at least then you're getting it out, right? This one said, I was asked where my hope comes from. And that question made me realize I don't have hope in anything. So that became my starting place. Another said, I'm not at war with myself like I had been. I'm reminded of a veteran that I had an opportunity to work with who Actually, it's a really cool story. I was kind of ahead of my time a little bit with the telehealth groups, you know, pre-COVID and even before. A lot of people are like, ah, I don't think you can be successful with groups online. I beg to differ. You can. As a provider, you might have a little bit more of a headache afterwards because you're looking for posture and, and, and things that you would normally come very naturally in a face-to-face -face interaction, right? But this individual was infantryman who was in Afghanistan and befriended a young boy, eight years old, there in the area where their complex was, and really fought at developing, you know, like this young boy was somewhat pursuing him, right? You know, just kind of saw him and and a lot of command doesn't look at that very great, you know, don't don't make friends with the civilians, you know, protect yourself. Uh, but but we're people. And when you're people who genuinely care about other people, you, you make friendships, you know, you create relationships. And so he did. And then that turned into this 
infantryman meeting his family. And then that conversation turned into with the dad of the family that whenever the enemy is around, we're going to put this color rug out on the outside so you know. And whenever it's safe, then we'll put this color rug outside so you all know that it's safe. And this went on for months. And then all of a sudden, no contact from the boy, no contact from the dad. And so they decide to go do some reconnaissance. And when they go into their home, they find the boy, the dad, the sisters, the mom, everybody hanging dead. And so this particular soldier felt he's responsible for it. I mean, he started the relationship, right? I mean, he's the one that had the conversation with the dad about the rugs and everything. And what really led to back home when he's away from all of this, married to a beautiful young lady, but doesn't want to be intimate because that would mean they'd have a kid and he doesn't want to have a kid because when he, you know, is around kids, kids die. That was basically the construct he had built within his head. Right. And I remember, you know, at the end of our 12 weeks working through wheel real, we always give the group the ability to, you know, ritualistically close it out like they want to. Right. I've had them write down last words to their, you know, people that they didn't get to say something to. And we tie it to balloons and send it off. I've had them build a gazebo together. I've had everybody in the group companion one person to the graveside of their battle buddy that they haven't seen or visited since they got back. You know, just little things like that. Well, this particular one, um, this veteran wanted his wife to be involved with the last part. And so she showed up with him to the last group and, you know, they're virtually, they're in New York, they're in Buffalo, New York. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she starts talking about (laughs) the husband she never had that she now has that for the first time in her marriage, she believes because they had known each other before he'd gone to combat that she believed the man that she fell in love with, the one that she wanted to have a family with, is back. And now they're talking about having kids and things like that. (sighs) Come on, y'all. That's like, you know, I could listen and hear stories about that like all day, but maybe you're out there listening to this and you feel like, well, that could never happen to me. I don't know if I could... I don't know if my wife would ever say that about me. Well, look, one thing about excuses is we all have them. And I'm not going to sit here and say to you that are listening that you're just developing excuses to not move forward because that would be disingenuous. I don't know what you've been through and I don't know how you feel, but I do know what loss is like. And I do know what having my meaning making system fractured feels like. That for me, I really had the inability to name or even grieve my losses. So maybe come alongside some people that understand the subject matter, that would love to companion you, that would love to develop trust. Um, Because the things that are really lost in moral injury are really trust, autonomy, competence identity. And if you feel like you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going, you don't know your place in the world, you really just feel like best thing for me to do is just check out. Then talk to someone. Talk to someone about your experience. Because I can tell you this, I've been around a lot of people who say, oh, I'll never share that. Well, I'll never share that, right? Um, And then they're around someone who is authentic, honest, and intentional about going head to head with what they're dealing with. And when you sit or you're near someone like that and you hear their story, what happens is what I call the peroxide effect. You know, when you pour peroxide on a wound, what does it do? It bubbles, right? And when someone intentionally tells their story authentically, it just bubbles the story out of the other person, right out of Like, I love it. There are people who be like, oh, I'll never tell that. And then all of a sudden, boom, you just told it and then some. 
Why? Because it helps heal. It's so important to tell your story and unpack and deconstruct all of the assumptions you have built around yourself and around the story because we really do have the ability around loss to really create something that's not what it is. You know, a lot of Vietnam veterans I've worked with that have uh, been hung up on, well, the Bible says thou shall not kill. And man, I killed 200 Vietnamese soldiers at least. Well, first of all, that's not what the Bible says. A matter of fact, the original Hebrew text says thou shall not murder. So if you were coming from a, theistic view of the Christian faith and you were hung up on the thou shall not kill. First of all, it's not what it says. It's murder. And I believe everybody who can hear me would agree that there's a big difference between killing and murder. Don't like either one of them, but there is a difference, especially in the intent of the heart. And one thing I know is that if you're listening to this and, and you're even feeling a little bit uncomfortable about the subject of moral injury, Lean into that. Figure out what that is. Why? Why are you uncomfortable? And search out. Search out like an investigator would trying to find something. Figure out what that is. Why is that? Why do you feel that way? Why is your chest tight right now? Why are you wanting to breathe a little heavier? Um, Are there things that you have set aside? locked in a box, like an unmarked grave, hoping nobody ever stumbles upon or never digs there. Um, To me, that just sounds like a nightmare to try and hide from peace. Well, Dr. Carter, I really appreciate all of your insight and, and sharing your story And thank you for speaking directly to any of our listeners who may for themselves have any of these ideations or need this insight or may be able to take the time to create that space to reevaluate where they're at and they can actually reach out and get the help um, that they're looking for. It was such an insightful conversation. Yeah, I'd be amiss if I didn't say if you are having thoughts of suicide, then call 988. Call the National Crisis Line number, press one if you're a veteran, and there will be there there are there people there to support you right now. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully no one is reacting that way. But one thing's for certain that I do know: when you talk about moral injury, um, the chances of you being negatively triggered are pretty good. They're pretty good. When you hear stories like that, they're probably going to be some type of reaction to it. Um, and that's okay. Just remember, because you suffer from a moral injury, does it's not a defect in you. It's actually 100% a highlight of all the things that are right about you. You wouldn't suffer morally if you didn't have morals. So don't forget that, that your suffering comes from the the best place of good in you, the place that decides what's right or wrong, good or evil, fairness or not, that place that, you know, um, is important for us to be conscious of. And you suffer there because you're good, not because you're bad. Yeah, it's beautiful. And a question that we ask all guests on the show, can you please share three fundamental pillars that contribute to your well-being? Yeah, for me, uh, number one is self-care, obviously. And a lot of my conversation today is really built around my model of care. But a lot of times we say that and we're like, oh, you know, it, it's kind of like, yeah, self-care. Well, what does that exactly mean? I shoot archery competitively. I found that the sport of archery actually helps me uh, normalize my breathing to be able to shoot good. You got to got to breathe well. Um, I do a lot of journaling myself, um, because even I carry some stories that sometimes I think, man, I don't want to share this with someone, but I do need to get it out. And then the last would be just the importance on family community is a pillar for me. Uh, those connections, um, are super important because 
I don't ever want to feel like I'm alone. Loneliness is not a place any of us need to be. That place where we feel like all hope is gone. So making sure I'm in touch with community, different service organizations, my family, uh, friends, and being intentional about keeping those connections is a, is a major pillar for me. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Chuck. And where can our listeners find you? Well, you can obviously check out Hunt Therapy at hunttherapy.org. Remember, it's one T in Hunt Therapy. And um, my day job with the Department of Veteran Affairs, uh, you can reach me at carter.check at va.gov. So my full name with a period in between, C-A-R-T-E-R dot C-H-E-C-K at V-A dot G-O-V. And if I can help in any way, I'd love to. Thank you, Dr. Chuck, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Chuck. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was my honor and pleasure as well. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening. This has been Sophia Unfiltered, a podcast by Sophia Health, the number one marketplace for health and wellness. Find services, classes, and products from the top health and wellness providers. Book an appointment or join live classes now. I'm your host, Riley Reese. If this episode resonated with you, we'd love to hear about it in the comment section of your favorite podcast provider or with a five-star rating. Let us know what your biggest takeaway from this episode was or share it with someone you hope to inspire. Join us again next time for more real conversations, stories, and insights that help empower you with the knowledge and inspiration needed to transform how we care for ourselves. Mm -hmm.